Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, find the city with the smallest number of neighbors at a threshold distance. And sometimes to be honest, I wonder why do people even watch my videos and then I go and like look at the editorial and I see this behemoth of a solution. I don't know why they needed 84 lines to implement this. I mean, they do have some comments here and there, but still 84 lines. You can see my solution is going to be less than 30 and I think it's still pretty readable. So you can be the ultimate judge. But let's get into this problem, which I think I actually solved four years ago. The idea is we're given a graph. I don't necessarily know if it's a connected graph or not, but in any case, it is a weighted graph. Each edge has a weight and each edge is undirected. So it goes both ways. And the idea behind this problem is that consider for every single node, we want to know from here, how many nodes could we reach without traveling a distance greater than four? The max distance we can travel is four. That's a max total distance. So you can see that one path we could take is this direction. That's three. And then from here, we can go down to this guy. That's a distance of one. So the total distance of this would be four. At that point, we can't really go further unless maybe if this was a zero, but I don't think we have to worry about negative edges or anything like that, which is going to make our life easier. But we can't really go any further from there. So maybe from here we can go, but no, with a distance of three plus four, this one is not going to work. This one is not reachable. So from this node, we can reach two other nodes and you can kind of follow a similar process so let's just record that for zero it's one or sorry it's two nodes we can reach and then from this guy we can go here we can go here and we can go here as well so actually from here we can reach three nodes so we'll say from one we can reach three nodes and we can continue from here we can go one two and three so actually two can also reach three nodes and finally three can go one two it can never reach this guy because that guy could never reach us either. So three will have a count of two. Now, among all of these, we care about the ones that can reach the minimum number of nodes. These ones can reach three, but these two can reach only two other nodes. Now, since there is a tie, how do we do a tiebreaker? Well, we choose the node that has a greater value. So among these two, we would favor this one. And so this would be the result. That's the return value in this case, as you can see down here. So let's consider the brute force because we can't really do much better than the brute force in this problem. And even the brute force might be hard enough for you. I think for a medium problem, this is not going to be trivial. So let's just kind of focus on that. There are multiple ways to solve this problem. Let's just first start with like DFS or BFS. Which one of these two algorithms do you think is going to be better in this case? Given a node, we want to know how many other nodes we can reach. We can travel in any potential direction. Generally speaking, BFS is better for that. Now, under the family of BFS algorithms, there is a very popular algorithm. You might have heard of it, and it might make you nervous just thinking about it. Dijkstra's algorithm. I cover it heavily, I think, in my advanced algorithms course. You can even implement it from scratch, I think, in one of the code sandboxes, which is free on NeatCode.io. Why exactly will that be helpful here? Because we have a threshold. Well, why is that? important. Why is that a BFS thing? Why is that related to Dijkstra's? Well, consider this. From here, we're asking what are all the other nodes that we can reach? And we want to stay under this threshold. So if there is a path from zero to one, of course, we would want to find the shortest path there because taking the long path to get there is useless because then we might exceed the distance threshold and not recognize that we could indeed reach the other node from zero. That's the intuition behind this. Now, even if you recognize this, how are you going to solve the problem? Like, even if you don't know maybe how to even implement uh, Dijkstra's algorithm, you still at the very least could probably give me the high level solution, which is from every single node, we're going to run a Dijkstra's algorithm, like an augmented version of it, slightly modified. And we're going to determine like which are the nodes that we can reach. First of all, which nodes can we reach? And once we have those, we can obviously count those nodes and then return that. So running a Dijkstra's algorithm from every single node as the source node will give us what are all the nodes that we can reach. 
Suppose we're given n nodes. What is the time complexity of Dijkstra's algorithm? Because that's going to be the overall time complexity. Well, this might make more sense in the code, but if you remember how Dijkstra's is implemented, we do use something called a heap. Specifically, we're going to use a minimum heap because it is a greedy algorithm. And the max possible size of that heap, you might first think it's going to be n, where n is the number of vertices. But let's say it's actually e. But e is never going to be greater than or equal to n squared, right? I think that roughly makes sense because for every edge, it can only be connected to every other node, right? So this is pretty fundamental. So if you believe this, you know that the max size of the heap is going to be e or n squared. So let's say n squared for a second. So pushing and popping from that heap of size n squared is going to be log n squared operation. If you remember how logs work, this too actually becomes a constant. So that's why we don't care if it's n squared or if it's n because it will pretty much reduce to log n. So that's going to be the time complexity of pushing and popping from the heap. Now to run a Dijkstra's algorithm, every node could be added to the heap not just once but actually n squared times because again that's the number of edges that we have in the graph so like if we had like five edges connecting to this node that node might be added to the heap that many times so this is the time complexity of Dijkstra's algorithm a single time so if i just you know insert that over here you can do the math and pretty much get that the time complexity is going to be n cubed log n I don't think it makes a ton of sense to go further into this explanation. I think I probably have a much better video explaining exactly how Dijkstra's algorithm works. And I'm pretty sure it's free as well. So if you just go to neatcode.io and I think under the basics tab, if you search for Dijkstra's, there should be a very detailed explanation exactly for how that algorithm works. I think you should start there because I'm going to run a slightly modified version of that algorithm right now. Before I implement the code, I wanted to quickly mention that right before I started recording this video, I was actually working on adding these animations to the DSA for Beginners course. You can see, I think that these are going to be very, very helpful for visualizing exactly how an algorithm works. So I have this right now for matrix BFS. I also have some animations for how like an adjacency list traversal works. Pretty soon, I plan on adding animations for the advanced course as well. Don't quite have one for a Dijkstra's algorithm right now, but hopefully next month we will. So first things first, in terms of the code, we're given a list of edges, which do have a weight, but we want to convert that into an adjacency list. So what I'm going to do is create a default dictionary where the default value is going to be a list, because for every node, we want to map it to a list of its neighbors. So I'm going to go through v1, v2, and distance in edges. There's three values in every single edge. We're going to say that v1 can add to it a neighbor of v2. We're going to say the same thing for the other one. So v2 can have a neighbor of v1. But remember, we want to keep track of the distance of each edge as well. We don't want to lose that information. It's going to be important. So I'm actually going to add a tuple here. If you wanted, you could add an array. I don't think it really matters whether you use an array or a tuple in Python. I think I just prefer to use a tuple because I know this is not going to change so tuples can't be modified um, and then here as well now next I'm going to define my Dijkstra's algorithm and I'm only going to give it a source because Dijkstra's is not a recursive algorithm all we need to do is give it the source and it should be able to run for now I'm not going to fill it in yet what if you don't know Dijkstra's algorithm well you can still get pretty far or maybe you're trying to remember it you're nervous well at least implement the part that you know how to do we know at the very least we want to run Dijkstra's on every single source node and the nodes are actually given to us from 0 to n minus 1 so I'm going to say for source in range n and I'm going to run Dijkstra on this source node. Now we expect this Dijkstra not to return the actual shortest paths. We expect it to return the number of nodes that this guy can reach where we stay under this distance threshold up above. So let's assume that it does that. It returns the count. Then we want to minimize that count. So I'm going to declare a couple variables up here. First, I'm going to have result. That's going to be the resulting node that we return. I'll initialize it to negative one. We're also going to have a variable called min count. That's going to be the node that has the minimum count. And of course, we're trying to minimize this. So we should set it to a very big value. You could do float of infinity, but you don't even have to go that far. We know that a node can't possibly visit n different nodes. If we have n nodes, we're not going to count if a node can visit itself. So if you want to set this to a really big value, just set it to n because every single node will be able to reach less nodes than n. Now I'm going to say if the count 
was less than, but I'm not just going to say less than, I'm going to say less than or equal. And I'll explain why in just a second. I'm going to say if it's less than or equal to the minimum count, then update the result and update the minimum count. Set the result to the source, set the minimum count to the count that we just computed. Now, try to guess why I did less than or equal. Consider the case where there's a tie. We're going through these nodes in order, in ascending order, right? Suppose I had a node one, it can reach two different nodes. Suppose later on I have a node uh, four, it can also reach two different nodes. So even though the count isn't less than the previous count, it's only less than or equal, we still favor this as the result because this has a greater value than the previous node. So this is what we would want to be the result. We can handle it like this because we're already going through the nodes in ascending order. And so if we get a case where they're equal, we would still want to update the result in that case. So that's kind of a clever way of doing it. And then of course, at this point, we would just return the result. So now notice we have literally everything except Dijkstra's algorithm. And I think that's only gonna be about like 10 or 15 lines of code. It's not trivial, but it's not like a ton of code. So let's see if we can do this. With Dijkstra's, we know for sure we're gonna need a heap, a minimum heap. The way to initialize that in Python is just use an array. We obviously need to keep track of the node itself, right? So you might think just add that to the heap, but that's not gonna be the key of the heap. That's not the most important key. We are also gonna add the distance of every particular node to the heap. So here I'll leave a comment saying the distance and the node. The distance should go first because that's the first sort key. That's what we wanna prioritize, the nodes with the smallest distance. So I'm gonna add that here. Initially, for this source node, the distance was zero because we started there. And I'm also gonna have a visit hash set. In regular Dijkstra's, you might have like a hash map or something to actually keep track of the distance of each node, like the minimum distance, but we don't really need to do that in this problem. We don't care about the distance, or at least we don't care to return it. If visit is going to keep track of all the nodes that we can reach starting from the source node where we stay under this threshold, if that's the case, then what should we return? Well, possibly the length of visit. But I'm also going to add a minus one because we're going to end up marking the source node as visited. We have to. But the source node doesn't count as a node that we can visit from starting at the source node. So that's where the minus one comes from. We're trying to disclude the source node in that calculation. Okay, now finally for the actual core algorithm, we're gonna say while the heap is non-empty, just like you would do in a regular breadth first search, pop from the queue. The only difference is this is a priority queue. So heap queue dot, I'm forgetting stuff, heap queue dot heap pop, and given the heap, return the distance and the node, because that's exactly what we added to the heap. So once you have that, if this node has already been visited, it doesn't make sense to go through all the neighbors of that node and then push them to the heap again, because again, Dijkstra's is a greedy algorithm. Like the first time we reach a node, we assume that was the shortest path to reach that node. So we don't care about the second shortest path to reach that node. That's not really gonna do anything for us. Here we're gonna say, if node is in visit, if it's already been visited, just continue to the next iteration. Don't do anything here. Otherwise, add it to visit so that we don't you know do it again and after that go through the neighbors of that node and then do some stuff but remember we didn't just add one value to the adjacency list we added a pair because the distance of each edge is going to be important i'm going to call this distance two because i'm not very creative but you might have a better variable name for it now we wanna know the total distance. We're gonna assume that this distance given to us is the total distance to reach this node. And now from this node, if we wanna to go to its neighbor, and if that edge has this distance, then the total distance to reach this node is gonna be this. I'm gonna call it neighbor distance, and it's just gonna be the sum of distance one and distance two. This is the tricky part. You might be very tempted to say heap uh, Q, heap push, to the heap, a tuple, which is the neighbor distance, and second, the neighbor node itself. You might be tempted to do this, but don't forget, we do have to stay under that threshold, so you try to guess what I'm gonna do here right now. It's not super complicated. We're only going to check if the neighbor distance is less than or equal to that distance threshold, then we are going to do this. Otherwise, if we went over the threshold, just feel free to skip that neighbor. 
So not bad. It looks like we got it done in about 28 lines of code, but that's not really the measure of success. We're not trying to get this to be as short as possible. We're trying to keep it readable and also relatively maintainable, which I think we did, right? We kind of modularized it. This is the part where we're building the adjacency list. This is the Dijkstra's implementation. It's a little bit augmented. We're not actually calculating the shortest paths. We're just kind of counting the number of nodes that we could visit while staying under this threshold. That's the kind of main change that we did to Dijkstra algorithm and then down here we're literally just running it a bunch of times on every source node keeping track of which one had the minimum count and then returning it and you can see that this solution is pretty efficient so i'm going to go ahead and leave things there and probably go get back to work hope you have a good day